Well, if you've been here for the last few weeks, you'll know that we've been, as, as ever shared in prayer, we've been talking about this whole idea of together, of being together, uh, better together. And uh, so this morning we're going to continue. And, and as we do that, I just want to um, probably just start with a bit of a principle that I think is really, really important. Uh, and it comes out of my, uh, my life uh, and love of this sport, basketball. If you've been a part of our uh, church family for the last few years, you'll know that um, I love this game. It's been good to me. Uh, it's taught me some life lessons. And uh, as someone growing up playing basketball, I had uh, the privilege of some phenomenal coaches. I really did. In fact, when I was playing rep ball in South Australia for a club called the North Adelaide Rockets, you don't care, you're Queenslanders, but that was a great club. That was one of, one of the more prominent clubs to play for. And uh, I was really fortunate to have a coach uh, in my uh, under 16 years and in my under 20 years who, who had represented Australia not only in basketball but in lacrosse. I mean, she was an athlete, really was, and, uh, and really privileged to have her speak into our life as, as players. And as a young player, really wanting to get the most out of this sport to reach my full potential, I loved it, I enjoyed it too much probably, but... I remember saying to her, how do I make it from where I am when I started in under 16s, I was started in Division 3, how do I make it to Division 1, how do I play this? And at that stage of my life, even wondering whether there was a possibility I could play it professionally. And she gave me the same advice, so I guarantee anybody that's had any coaching in your life, she gave me the same advice. So I'm going to share it with you, you're going to go, yep, been there, done that. doesn't matter whether it was sport, maybe it was dance. Maybe it was drama, maybe it was summer hobby, I don't know. But she said, Adam, if you want to realise the potential that's in you, if you want to get the most out of this sport, then I expect to see you train hard. I expect that you will train with the same or more intensity with which you play. You will get out of this sport what you put into it. You will get out what you put into it. Now, who here grew up with a parent that gave them this philosophy? You get out of life what you put into it. My children should both have their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> you get out of life what you put into it. Now, I'm not saying this is an absolute, because sometimes life serves you up some difficult things, but generally speaking, I think this is true. We get out of things what we put into it. The unrealistic mindset that I'll get out of something without putting anything into it. Such a consumer mindset. I'm entitled. I deserve this. I don't have to give any effort. Just give me what... No, 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 no. That's not a good life philosophy. You'll get out of life what you put into it. This is what my coach instructed me with. And wow, did she train us hard. But I ended up playing Division One basketball. Put the effort in and got out of it some great reward. You know, the Apostle Paul, he wrote to some Christians in the ancient city of Corinth about this same idea, because the same is true of the Christian faith. Uh, we can actually maximise the potential of a life following Jesus when we're actually prepared to invest in that journey with him and allow his grace to work in us to bring out all of the potential that he's placed inside of us. And so Paul wrote to these Corinthians, we find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, he said this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Now let me pause. The games he's talking about, this is written in the first century, so 2,000 years ago. He's not talking about the Olympic Games, he's probably speaking about the Ithmian Games. The Ithmian Games were like the Olympics, they had athletic activity, swimming, wrestling, all the things that went on in the Roman Empire at the time, but it was way cooler because they had like poetry competitions. <laughs> and things like that, drama competitions in the games. So he's saying everyone that plays in these games, they're going to strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last because the crown you got at the Eastman Games was a crown of celery. Pre-refrigeration technology. You win that prize, it doesn't really last. Well done, here's your celery crown. 
that would have lasted for a couple of days. Put that on your cabinet, imagine all these ancient people, trophy shelf, all this mouldy stuff. I won the poetry competition at the Isthmian Games, look at my mouldy story. They do it to get a crown that will not last, it did not last. But we do it as Christians to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. He's talking about this life following Christ, the Christian faith. I'm going to read this to you again from the message translation. It puts it into contemporary language just to earth this a bit more for you. In the message translation, Paul says this, same words, just modern language. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs, one wins. Run to win in your Christian life. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. It's eternal life in Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else about it, and then missing out myself. Little interesting insight that a lot of Christians, we are educated well beyond our level of obedience. Where we're able to reap the fullness of all that God has for us. So hold on to these thoughts as we return to this idea that we are better together. Hold on to that concept about what it means that we, we put ourselves into strict training in the Christian life. To get out of it all that God intends for us to get out of it, not to miss out. As we think about this idea of being better together. So, so far in our series, this is week three. In our first week we talked about that circles are better than rows. We're talking about our life groups and the life of our church. Circles are better than rows. Some things are done better face-to-face, facing one another, doing life together in that context. That's not to say circles, not rows. Okay? You'll never hear that from the pulpit while I'm here. Because there are some things that can go on that can only go on while we're in rows. And yes, you might see the person's head in front of you. But there's just some things that happen when we come together that can't happen when we are dispersed. In the early church in the first century, they were city-wide churches. They were one church in the city, but they would gather in smaller groups, in circles, in households as well. Now, we live in a different era. We live in a modern uh, 21st century Australia, and so the family unit is different, which is why we know that a good-sized life group is probably six to eight, and by the time you hit 10, you're already thinking about maybe we should be a couple of groups. But circles are better than rows for some of what we want to do as we realise the potential that God has put in us. And then last week, if you were here, Karen spoke to us about the marks of a healthy life group. What's going on in a life group? What's being cultivated that's healthy so that everybody thrives? So today, what I want to talk to you about are the marks of a healthy life group member. What are the marks of someone who's a part of a life group? And we would hope that everybody in the life of our church is involved in a life group in some form or another. What are the marks of a healthy life group member? What do you bring? Because I'm going to put this to you. You will get out of your life group what you put into it. You get out of your life group what you put into it. So I'm going to share with you five things. Five things today, reasonably quickly, buckle up that I think are helpful things that each person in a life group, in a circle, doing life, wanting to maximise their experience of, of, um, of their relationship with Jesus in community with others, five things that you should have as a mark that you're bringing when you come to a life group. Are you ready? First one is this. You should give to your life group. I, I don't mean like give financially, although you know, if there's need in your life group, that's something you should think about. But give, come with an attitude to give to your life group. You're actually coming to give out, not primarily to receive. I'm a part of this life group for what I bring, me as a unique gift to the group. You are a gift. I'm coming to give 
to the group. Now, the interesting thing is, in our highly consumer-oriented society that we live in, and that's where we spend most of our week, don't we? Out in our consumer-driven society. This is very, very countercultural. It actually means that we would be prepared to change our orientation from self to others. That I'm in this for what I give and not for what I get. Very, very countercultural concept. And if you don't think you're influenced by this, it is part of what we call fallen human nature. We are born this way with an orientation to self. I mean, parents here, you know that when you think about your children when they were really little, this is what they were like all the time, right? <laughs> they were smiling. They were just, life is great. My parents are awesome. That's not true. It's often more like this. <laughs> Because from a very, from birth, ah, feed me, ah, change me, ah, I don't know, I just want something, ah, me, right? Human nature. If you're not convinced it's there, parents, uncles, aunties, older siblings, think about this. It's there. This is what's going on. We have to choose to overcome the ah, me nature and take on the attitude of a servant. We need to come to our life group looking for what we can invest, not what we can consume. But here's the thing in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, his economy works differently. Jesus actually spoke about this in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. He said, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. But with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now what's he saying? Give so you can get more? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying you can give and trust that you will be looked after. It's going to be okay. So give to your life group. That's the first one. Second one, respond to the needs of others in your life group. In your circle, respond to the needs of others. When you see the need, respond to it. The Apostle Paul, whom we read from before about the Isthmian Games, in his letter to another group in the ancient city of Philippi, in chapter 2, he says this, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. He's saying be mindful of the needs and the interests of others around you. And together as a group, we can come with this attitude. You see... The whole orientation of the New Testament, all of the teaching that we get about what it looks like to be followers of Jesus in this real life that he's made possible for us, is love one another. That's the whole orientation, letter after letter, scripture after scripture, Jesus teaching after Jesus teaching, is love one another. Not pastors love the people, the people receive it. Pastors love the people more, people receive it. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I don't like the phrase pastoral care. I far prefer the phrase congregational care, where we care for one another, where we look after one another. If you're in hospital and you tell me that a minister didn't visit you and someone from your life group did, I will lovingly, when you're better, rebuke you. Because everyone's a minister. When we care for one another, this is the orientation of the whole New Testament. This is what it looks like. We're called to love one another in our groups. We respond to the needs of others because we love one another. Now, this picture tells us something very important. It's a bit real for some of you. <laughs> But it's okay. This picture tells us or reminds us of a beautiful truth that Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 10. He teaches this. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Right? Every hair that falls, some of you, from your head. God knows about it. So this doesn't tell us simply, well, God's really good mathematically. 
Jesus is not making a statement that God can count. <laughs> this is not the profound thing here. What God, what Jesus is teaching us about God is that he notices. He notices every detail. He responds to your need because he's watching. He notices. And my friends, if we are to respond to the needs of others in our life, then we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. Now, with Matt's encouragement, I'm going to share with you an epic fail of paying attention in my life. When I was about 19, before I met the most gorgeous, wonderful bride of my life, I dated a girl that I'd met on a Baptist Easter camp, and, uh, and we had started to date. She lived on the other side of Adelaide. It was a 45-minute drive to see her. I should have realised I wasn't that serious about the relationship when I started to grumble about it in the 45 minutes. <laughs> it's a long time. It's a long time. <laughs> One night I arrived at her house to have dinner with her and her parents and this girl who was a lovely girl, lovely girl, um, beautiful long, dark hair, probably mid-length down her back, uh, she used to try and, and, and dress well and she's kind you know, and you know all of these things and we're sitting around the dinner table this night, I've been there for a couple of hours, a couple of hours, Just hold on to that, a couple of hours I had been with them all and at the dinner table her mum looks at her and says, did he notice? Okay. I just want you to know I learned a really valuable lesson that night. Really, really valuable lesson. So, at this point, I'm dying inside going, I'm supposed to have noticed something. Something simple, something subtle like, she dyed her hair blonde and had cut this short. She <laughs> had not noticed. <laughs> I'm a keeper. <laughs> so if you've ever been here and I've noticed your hair or a change of haircut or a change of shirt or that you just happened to be, I don't know, smiling today and you weren't last week, because I learned that night. <laughs> Pay attention. Pay attention to the needs of others. Bearing my soul. Well, that leads me to the next point. When you come to a group, you need to be open. You need to open your heart to people in your life group. You need to come to your life group prepared to be open and vulnerable. Introverts, I'm speaking to you. Because there's nowhere in Scripture where categorization happens that says certain rules of behaviour for extroverts. Certain rules of behaviour for introverts. Now there is the call to be considerate of others. We do see different personality types expressed throughout Scripture, so I'm not having a go at you or at anyone in particular, but the call to be open and vulnerable in your group is a call to everyone to bring yourself openly, flawed, not noticing your girlfriend's major hair change self to your life group, flaws of all, you come and be vulnerable. We know you don't have it all together. You know we don't have it all together, so we're not going to pretend. Our church is called Real Life, and that's what we do. And in our life groups, you need to be open and open your heart to the people in your life group. Jesus actually modelled this for us himself. Jesus, the only perfect person to ever walk, he modelled an openness to his group. Now, what we know is that Jesus had 12 people that he spent a lot of time with. He had a life group. He had a circle. Beyond that circle, we know there are at least 72. We know that at some point in his ministry training and discipleship of others, that he released 72 people to go out and do ministry. And then beyond that, we know there were probably another 500 people that followed him around Israel at the time. But within all of that crowd and that cohort, he had a core of 12. And within that core, there were three. There were three, Peter, James and John, that he spent more time with than the rest. These three, they got unique opportunities with Jesus. There was some ministry that they were the only ones present for. There were three within the 12. He didn't equally give his time to all 12. 
He didn't equally share the same level of vulnerability with everyone in the group, but he was definitely very vulnerable with these three. And where we see this most profoundly is in Matthew 26. Jesus, it's the night that he has been betrayed or he's about to be betrayed. The next morning he will go to the cross <coughs> and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane with his whole life group. No, with the three. And he says this, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Please pray with me. Keep watch for me. Jesus, he hasn't done anything wrong. There's no sin there. He's just being vulnerable. I'm struggling. I'm overwhelmed. Life is hard right now. Would you stand with me? Would you watch with me? Would you pray with me? This is so important that we do this. When we bring our openness to our group, acknowledging that we are a gift to the group, when we come with openness, it gives permission to others to be open to. I even think there's some generational dynamics around this as well. I, I think um, millennials and, and younger, we're like quite happy. We just put all kinds of, I say we, I'm not, but anyway, put all kinds of stuff up on our social media and you can see in and some of it's facade, we just want you to be impressed and, and some of it's truth and, and we like this. I think generationally going back, the more stoic Australians are. But learning to be open gives permission to others to be open as well. Now, that being said, we need to be beware of the EGR person, especially that we don't become the EGR person. You all know an EGR person. They are an extra grace required person. <laughs> extra grace required. What that means is we want to come and be open but we don't want our life group to be all about our issues year after year after year. Our life group does not exist to deal with our issues only. Our life group exists to help us do life together well, to grow in Christ. And while your issues should be shared and vulnerable, it's not all about that because everybody around that circle is going to have their own issues. We love one another. We don't want to be that person that makes it all about us. Every time we get together, I'm looking around the room at some of our life group leaders who are like, <laughs> <laughs> So just be aware of that. We come open, but creating a sense of openness for everyone. All right, so far we've talked about give. We've talked about respond to the needs of others. We've talked about being open. The fourth thing that I want to share with you is this. Understand the vital nature of relationships. In our life, we need to understand this. You know, sometimes I think we might think, particularly if we find people hard, or maybe we just, you know, whether it's we're introverted or we just socially, we just um, struggle from time to time. I'd be so mature as a Christian if it wasn't for all these other people. If it could just be me and Jesus, it'd be amazing. It's not the way we're wired. It's not the way we're created. And in fact, I doubt you'll reach your maximum potential in Christ as a hermit. I really don't think you will. Because it's not the way God built us. In the Genesis narrative, we see Genesis 1, we see Genesis 2. It's kind of the same story, but kind of repeated through, through a couple of different perspectives. And in Genesis 1, we see this. God creates, he says, it's good. Day 1, ah, oh, created, it's good. Day 2, creates, God says, it's good, and so on and so on. And he gets to the point where he creates humanity, he creates Adam, and he goes, it's very good. You, me, human beings, we're very good. Talk to someone next to you. They probably just need to be encouraged. You are very good. Shake your you know? <laughs> single guys, single girls, now's your chance. Look them in the eye. And go, <laughs> You're very good. This is how we were created. We're the pinnacle of creation. Created in God's image. God says it's very good. So Genesis chapter 1, God creates, however he goes about that. Good, good, very good. Genesis 2. Not good. It's not good. Something's not good. Now, the not good is not that sin has entered the world. That doesn't happen in the narrative of Genesis chapter 3. There's not an issue of sin. Something's not broken. Humanity's not rebelling. 
It's not that God's looking going, they have messed it up. They're not good. No, 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 no. God looks at the creation at this point and he goes, this is not good. And some of you know where he says it's not good. We find it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. A co-equal to share dominion of, not a servant. If you look into the Hebrew at the word helper that's used here, it's not a servant. It is a co-equal. To be together in community, just like God is in community within himself. It is not good for us to do life alone. We were not created for that. And so we need to understand. Some of you might think, nah, it's not really that important. Life is not that important. I'm not really set on fire by that. It's a little bit inconvenient. And you know, I went once and it was a little bit, you know, I don't know. Uh, you were made for relationships. And maturity as a Christian comes in the context of relationships. And we need to put ourselves in those places where those relationships can happen. We need to understand that. That's a very important understanding. We need to understand the vital place of relationships in our journey as Christians. Now, here's the thing. Some of you have been to life groups and you discover that there were people there. <laughs> and Mark Connor, he's a great uh, pastor and the leadership coach. I've been able to spend some time with him. He, he says this, you know, life group, you might find Mr. and Mrs. Sandpaper. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Sandpaper rub you the wrong way. So you think, here, I'm going to go to a different life. I'm giving up on this life. I'm going to another one. You discover they've got cousins. <laughs> the Sandpaper family's huge. There's more in the next group. So now I'm going to go to another group. You go to the next group, group number three. Oh my goodness, they've got nephews and nieces. There's more Mr. and Mrs. Sandpaper here. Rubbing you the wrong way. By the time you're thinking about group number four, can I suggest to you, have a look in the mirror, it might be that you are Mr. and Mrs. Sandpaper. You're going to find people in relationships who rub you the wrong way. The idea that you be in a life group with everybody that's comfy for you and warm for you and easy for you means you're probably not going to grow because you need a bit of... Now, the funny thing is, probably not with this group, if you look at that, it's pretty coarse. But with enough rubbing, what happens to work? It gets smooth. Yeah, it forms, right? Really, really important. And no one likes this, but the image that we find in Proverbs around that dynamic is found in Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. That's what we get to do in our faith, in our challenges, in our growth, and sometimes in our trials. We get to, as a gift to our group, in sharing openly and vulnerably and encouraging and loving one another, we get to sharpen one another. But... What do you notice in this image about iron sharpening iron? There are sparks. Okay? There are sparks. There can be sparks sometimes. But I don't know about you, maybe this is a blokey thing, but whenever I've seen anybody working with iron and iron like that and there are sparks, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> Way more exciting than just, you know, wow, that's sharp, right? No fun at all. I want to see the sparks. The sparks tell us that in the friction, things are being worn away that shouldn't be there. So don't be afraid of the sparks. Don't be afraid of them. Understand the vital place of relationships and how they work their way out in your life. There are no perfect life groups because there are no perfect people. There are no perfect people here at Real Life Christian Church. You will not find yourself in a life group with anybody perfect. There are no perfect life groups. And if you think there are and you join it, it won't be anymore. <laughs> so the last thing that we want to bring as a healthy life group member is an attitude where we understand that we place our life firmly in the love of God for you. That we place our life in that place In, uh, in Ephesians, Paul again, he writes chapter 3, <coughs> hoping and praying that the people in the church in Ephesus, that they'll know this and place 
their life in the love of God for them. He says this, I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's people, the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. He's saying, make this the place where you live. Planted, placed, positioned in the love of God for you. Now, around the communion table earlier, we celebrated his grace. And it's important to understand that that is the lens of God's love to us, is grace. You cannot earn this. He's your heavenly Father. He loves you because he made you very good. When our first son was born, I remember being there. Claire was doing all the amazing work that mums do, bringing a, a life into the world. And she worked hard. She worked for a very long time. I think it was 26 hours. It was a long time. And, you know, I had a really hard job. I got to have a snooze halfway through that 26 hours. Um, just to make sure that I was ready for the important job I had. Um, and as we get into the exciting end of this journey, uh, I was doing what I was trained to do, helping encourage her and, and, and to um, you know, make sure that you breathe like this. This is good. You're doing great. Doing everything I could. And our obstetrician, he looks over in these moments and he says to one of the nurses in the birthing suite, he says, uh, Nurse, can we, can we get some gloves on Adam? And I'm like, yes, that's a great idea. Let's keep this clean. Let's keep this hygienic. Maybe put a gown on him. I'm like, that's great. I like these clothes. I know it's going to be messy. Let's keep me all, all in good nick here, thinking nothing of it. Gloves go on. I'm doing my job. Very important job. I'm coaching and helping. And the obstetrician says, Adam, could you please put your hand here? And I did. And all of a sudden, I had Isaiah's head. And he said, Adam, I would get your other hand ready too. <laughs> <laughs> and I caught it. I'm so glad he didn't warn me. Because I might, you know, I, I would have probably been too nervous and too scared and, and, and something could have happened there. And I remember holding this newborn one and, and just being overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with love. Just, I will die for you. I'm going to do anything I can to give you every opportunity possible within my means. This thing is amazing. He hadn't done anything. <laughs> all he was doing was what babies do. Like every baby does, they cry, right? Uh, it, uh, and all of this, and I'm having this epiphany in this moment. Oh my goodness, all this love, all this love. I'm going, but this is how God feels about me. I have two sons. I don't want to embarrass them. I think they're amazing. Here's what I know. I love them beyond measure. I love them, I love them enough to call them to a higher standard. I love them enough to do everything I can to provide them opportunity after opportunity. But here's the thing. I don't love them because of what they do for me. I don't love them because of anything they achieve. I don't love them because they do or don't get good grades. I don't love them because they do or don't, I don't know, earn anything. Do you know why I love them so much? Because they're mine. <laughs> That is how God feels about each and every one of you. He loves you because you're His. That is all. You can't earn it. You don't need to earn it. He loves you. Place your life firmly in the love of God for you. Don't look to your life group for what only God can provide in your life. That sense of stability and love. They will remind you of this. They will express this to you. But don't go there thinking, they're going to do this for me. Because only God can do it. So this morning we've talked about give to your life group. We've talked about respond to the needs of others in your life group. We've talked about being open and opening your heart to your life group. We've talked about understanding the vital place of relationships and about placing your life firmly in the love of God for you. Remember this, you will get out of your life group what you put into it. If you're going to be in a healthy life group and be a healthy life group, remember, these are the heart attitudes that you will bring. It's so true. But you'll notice they're all heart attitudes. They're all heart attitudes. And if you're like me, 
you know that some of them are hard to hold on to and to live out and walk out. So we're going to worship. I want to invite you to stand. Now, as we sing this song, I want to invite you to let the Holy Spirit minister to you, to challenge you about maybe one or all of these attitudes that you need to lay down. Oh, sorry, pick up an appropriate and lay down some other ones that aren't so fresh off. Let's enter in. Lord, lead us as we worship. Speak to us. Thank you for your love for us. We want to know you.